Thank you. You are, you can sit down. You are very kind. Thank you. I'm going to give him a second to work on this microphone. Is this about where you want it, brother? And so I'm, I'm one of these guys that once I get go on the microphones. Or so we'll try my best to keep it right about here. And then I talk very quietly in the beginning. And they, they inch it up. And then I scream and then they... So, I've always said, you know, there's one job in the kingdom I would never, ever, ever want to have. The sound man. <laughs> but you're doing a good job back there. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you all for being here. I've was in Sarasota several years ago. I don't know how long it's been, but it's been at least 10, maybe 15 years. Back when, back when I was um, a young man. And what a great, great turnout. Thank you so much for joining us. And those of you that are with us online, wherever that camera is, thank you. Thank you for joining us. and. Um, when you get people together like this, God can do significant things. He can do more through us than he can one of us. He can do more through us together than he can one congregation, one house. He, he would prefer, he prefers to work through uh, a unified people. He likes it so much he created a force called synergy which is really hard to understand. But if you work together, power doesn't add, it multiplies. And I just think God did that because he likes it when we come together. He, he wants his people to work together. He likes unity. He loves that. So we're here and we can ask God for big things. We can join our faith and our heart, our authority. And we can do whatever he wants us to do. We, whatever that is, we can do it. We can get accomplished, whatever he wants. So thank you for this invitation and the opportunity to be here. I love my friends over here. I love some of the rest of you. I see it. I love all of you, but I see, see some other familiar faces. I love those of you watching. And I love John Kilpatrick. So I'm... Um, thrilled that you get to be blessed by him this weekend as well. So I don't know where I'm going to end up tonight, but I'll just, I uh, should have asked you before I got up here, are we on time constraint of any kind? Okay. All right. <laughs> Not 15 minutes, I huh? know. Okay. <laughs> that was a shameless plug, wasn't it? I, I repent for that. <laughs> so I was reminded as I was uh, worshiping tonight of some things, and I'll just start there and go in, in a different direction. And I'm going to, uh, some territory I'll end up in, but just thinking about um, creation, how much God loves his family. You know, earth was not the dream. You were the dream. We are the dream. We're not an afterthought. God didn't create earth and then think about what he could do with it and come up with the plan to create people. He created this as our home because his plan was to create a family, his family, sons and daughters of a bride for his son. And so he, he spent the first several days, as we know, five days, getting the home ready. And every day he said, it's good. 
This is good. The word could be translated pleasant. Imagine God at the end of each day looking over the progress and saying this is pleasant. This is good. He wasn't patting himself on the back. He has no issue with esteem or self-confidence. He wasn't bragging. He wasn't uh, promoting anything he was doing. He was saying he was letting us into his heart. This is good. This is so pleasant to me. And then, of course, on the sixth day, when he made Adam and Eve, she came a little later, but she was already there in him. And that day he said, this is very good. This is, this is very good. He was satisfied. And then he took a day, and we, we say he rested, but uh, you know that word could just as easily be translated celebrate. Not my interpretation, the Hebrew word can be translated on the seventh day he celebrated. That gives a little different twist to the Sabbath, doesn't it? Don't just take a break, celebrate. Because dad was celebrating the fact that he had accomplished the goal of creating his family, and it was good, it was pleasant. And so we are the dream and we are the plan. When God moves things back toward, when he restores and moves the planet back toward his ultimate plan, which is what restoration really means. The Greek word is apokatastasis, and it means to reconstitute. It doesn't just mean fix. It means reconstitute. The constitution of something is the way it's made, the plan, the way it's supposed to work. So he's reconstituting things. He's back toward the plan. He's not trying to figure things out as he goes along. He's not wondering where it's going to end up. He's not getting to certain crossroads and having to think about, mm, where do we go from here? He declares the end Come on, help me finish it. From the beginning, Isaiah 46, 10. So he's the only person that doesn't start at the beginning. He starts at the end. He sees the finished product. It's as real to him as if it physically existed because in his mind, heart, and mouth, it does. So he declares the end from the beginning. So he's moving us toward something, but we are not, this is, I think, I want you to hear from the very beginning tonight. We are not a subplot in all of this. We are not one of several things he's doing and, you know, we people, we're, we're, we're a small part of it. We're not a small part of it. We're the reason for it. And Jesus is the answer, of course. But we're his answer. It was never his intention to do this any other way but through us. So, boy, that got quiet. Was that like going... Was that like a wow or was that like a whoa? I don't know about that. What's what? <laughs> so he cre creates it all and then he says to Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply and rule the earth. He gave him two commands, two commissions. <clears throat> multiply, give me more kids. I want lots of kids. He put within them the, how do, you, how, do you, how do you put into words the significance 
of what he said to them when he said, I'm going to paraphrase it, I'm giving you the ability to create eternal spirits. You are an eternal spirit. I put my breath in you. And now you're going to multiply that. You're my image. You're my likeness. Image. I don't want to get bogged down here. The teaching thing starting to come on me, but I don't want the teaching thing on me too much. I want to <laughs> decree thing. I want to mix with. But Salem, you're my image. You made us in his image. That word could be translated phantom because the root word is a shadow. It, it's the word for an illusion. It's a word that means we were so much like him when he finished and put his very breath, Holy Spirit went into us and we were so much like him. We weren't like the angels. We weren't like any of those animals. We were like him and we were so much like him that it was illusionary. So when creation saw Adam walk by out of the corner of their eye, they probably did a double take. I thought it was God. It's just Adam. And he was God's representative, and he was in God's likeness. Demuth is that word. It, it means comparable to. It's the root word compare, to compare. Who is he like? He, there was no, no one, no thing you could compare Adam to but him. Why? Because I am not making another billion angels. I want family, kids who have my nature, who can think like me, who can dream with me, who can work with me. I want something worthy of my son. So he said, you're going to multiply who I am in the planet. I put my nature and my spirit and my likeness. You're, you're as much like me as I could possibly make you without duplicating myself. In some ways, he did duplicate himself, not, not because of us, but he put him in us. He put himself in us. Are you, are you hearing me? He put himself in us, his very spirit. That's what that word breath means. Holy Spirit is the holy breath. We are the plan. That doesn't produce arrogance or pride. That produces amazing wonder and humility and awe. It makes you want to get on your face and say, you? And then he said, you're not only going to do that, but you're going to the planet for me. This home that I made for you, you're going to manage it. You're going to take care of it. Masha Rada, two words. Any good lexicon is always going to give you definitions like manage, steward, govern. Let me tell you why Satan hates government. Let me tell you why religious people that don't get it Hate, hate the concept of government and tell the church stay out of government. Don't talk about government so much. I'll tell you why. Because Satan has deceived people into this mindset that says government is evil when in, in reality God is government. His name is Lord. Isaiah 30, 33, 22 says he is the lawgiver. He is the lawgiver. He is the judge. He is the king. Government on earth is supposed to flow from heaven and God in heaven from there through people into the earth to bring justice, righteousness, order, security, safety. That's what it's supposed to do. I know it doesn't do that when it's working through fallen people, but we're supposed to be moving back toward the plan because he's reconstituting things back to the way he wants it to be. And when we pull out a government and say we don't want anything to do with it, we are handing the planet over to Satan and say, you can govern this. You can have it. The whole war is about who's going to rule the planet. So he gave two commissions. 
We might be here a while tonight because I'm not very far into this yet. So he gave two commissions. Give me more kids. Lots of kids. I want lots of kids, Adam. And govern the planet for me. You're going to be my voice. When you say it, that's it. So, that was so literal that Adam had the right to hand it off to somebody else to fall. And God had to come through another human being to get it back. This is why Jesus gave two great commissions. Let me just slow this train down for a second. He announced something very significant in Matthew 16. I'm going to build my church. Don't think about this. I'm going to oikotomeo, oikos, root word, household, family. The word means create a lineage. Form a household. That's the word build there. When he, when he said that word in one word, he, he was saying, I've come to get the family back. I'm here to take it back. I told you in the third chapter, I'm coming to do this. And I'm going to trounce on the head. And that word means a dominion, headship. I'm going to crush the headship of the serpent who thinks he has all authority on the earth now, but I'm coming to get it back. And he'll bruise my heel, but I'll crush his headship. And Jesus said, I'm here to get it back. And I'm here for the family. I'm here to recapture the dream. I'll, what kind of mail? Build. Not buildings, it's just, a, those are tools. People, people, people. I will oikotomeo my ecclesia. If you've ever heard me speak, you know what that is. <laughs> Church is not a, a service. It's not a building. It's not an organization. You don't go to church and do church. Ooh, we're going to go to church. Well, if you, if you, you're, you're only going to church if you do what that word means when you get there, which it was a word for a legislative governmental body of people. It was not even a religious term when Jesus said that. Apostles were not, uh, uh, that was not a religious term either. Nor was disciple. But the Greeks, legend, Ecclesia was a governing body of people. Still is in Greek sororities and fraternities. The Romans, same thing. It's, an, it's a governing body of people. And the Romans knew the only way we could rule a region and keep it under our rules. We've got, to, we've got to transform the thinking of these people to where they begin to think like Romans because if they, if they continue holding on to their Greekness or their Persian mindset, heart and ways, at some point they're going to want to rebel and go back to that and get their independence. But if we can, if we can do a transformation that turns them into Romans and they think like Romans and the monetary system is Roman and the culture is Roman, and the government is Roman, and the education is Roman. But at some point, they're just going to say, we're Romans. So they sent ecclesias in to rule conquered regions, led by an apostle. Boy, that got quiet. <laughs> led by an apostle... And their responsibility was to do more than rule. Their responsibility was to disciple that region until it, that 
kingdom thought like that kingdom. Jesus said, I'm going to get the family back. They're going to become my ecclesia again on this planet for me. And everywhere I tell them to go, they're not just going to Mark 16, get them saved, delivered, filled with the Spirit, cast out demons, etc. They're going to do Matthew 28. They're going to disciple that region until it thinks like headquarters. They're going to bring the, they're not going to dictate, they're going to do it from here. It's not a lording over people. It's a reaching the heart first. Mark 16, get them saved. The law of God, love for God. God's nature, all written inside of them on their heart. When that happens, everything changes. Now they care what God thinks. Now they care what He thinks. And then you begin to implement kingdom principles and you transform that region, that nation, into a people that think like heaven so they can be blessed more. Not religious. So we're the plan, you know. If it wasn't for us, he'd, well, number one, there wouldn't have been a curse. It wouldn't have been sin. But if it wasn't about us, even when that happened, he'd have just killed Adam and Eve and started over because he can have whatever he wants. But why would he do that? Because Adam was the plan. Adam and Eve was the family. The dream. So he said, it's going to cost me. It's going to cost me. But I'll have my dream. And so when Jesus said, if anyone's thirsty, come to me and drink. There's all this ritual, pouring of water from buckets and basins and sprinkling on the people, chanting. He interrupts the process. The, 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 the Pharisees, they, they hated it when he did this. So I'm going to paraphrase. He jumped up in the middle of it, John 7, and said, Oh, that's a picture of me. If anyone's thirsty, can you imagine the audacity? If, if they could have, they'd have killed him right then. If anybody's thirsty, come to me and drink. This stuff was just a painted picture to get us to this point in time, but the real water is here. I'm here now. But he said, if you drink, and all the tenses and all these verbs of this two or three, uh, verses there, John 7, 38, 39. It's all uh, imperative. It's a command. You have to do this, and it's all continuous tense. You can't just take a drink. You have to drink and keep on drinking. You have to thirst, be thirsty, and you have to keep on being thirsty. And then you have to keep coming to him, and then you have to keep on drinking. And if you keep on coming to him, and you, if you keep being thirsty, and you keep coming to him and drinking, then living water is going to keep on flowing out of you. And that's what the passage says. He said, if you do that, I'm here to fix this and reconstitute back the way it's supposed to be. And if you'll drink me, not from religion, not from a system, if you'll drink of me and keep drinking of me out of your belly, koilia, womb, is the, is the Greek word. Matrix. Out of your koilia will flow rivers of living water. Because I'm not going to be here forever. I'm turning it back over to you. I quiet again on that one. <laughs> so did you know that the water that flows from the throne, in Revelation 22, from the Lamb on the throne, the river of living water that feeds the trees, that heal the nations. Did you know that's the same language exactly 
as Jesus in, Matt, in John 7 when he said, out of your belly will flow. How can you say that? How could you be so audacious to say that? Because it's not, you're not the river. You just house the river. Drink from me, he said, and I will flow out of you. And I heal nations. I transform. I'm going to heal you. I'm going to heal the river. And healed water heals water. So I'm going to heal you. And then it's the water and you won't be poisoned. It'll be my water. My water heals. There is no plan B. What God wants to do on the planet, how's he going to do it? Go look around you. It's kind of scary, isn't it? No, I don't do it. Don't, don't, don't go there. Don't, don't go there. Don't go, don't go there. Look in faith. Because you're looking at his family and his ecclesia. Some don't really know it yet. They're learning. We're growing in our understanding. And we are the plan. So, you, so most of the time when a, when a place, a region, a, a nation, a household, most of the time when a place is all messed up, not most of the time, all the time. It's messed up because of us, not him. And it gets fixed. When it gets fixed, it gets fixed because somebody drinks and taps into who he is and he's allowed to flow through them in just the way he intended to do it from the very beginning and said in Matthew 16, I'm here to restore that and then commissioned us to go do it and somebody taps into that and says, wait a minute, I can heal this region. I can heal this house. I'm gonna kick demons out of my house. I'm gonna kick them out of my city. I am assigned to govern the planet for the king of kings. Now I'm gonna do it. We are the plan. We're not an afterthought. Now the church is positioned now. Obviously we haven't arrived. Obviously we're still growing, learning, maturing. But the church I'll expand it from the ecclesia and just make it general, the body of Christ. Because some people are in the body, but they're not the church. I know that messes with some of your heads. but Because you're not the ecclesia until you're governing, binding, loosing, taking the keys of the kingdom, and messing with the gates of hell. You're not the ecclesia until you're doing that. But you're still the bride. And he loves you just as much. And you're the body and the family of God. Because the first thing he said, when the, he didn't say I'm coming, he didn't start with ecclesia. He started with oikos. None of that dominion stuff and authority and none of our assignment, our working for him, none of that matters at all if we don't get first things first. If it's not built on relationship, family, intimacy with him. But 
where I was going with that, but I'll just go somewhere else. <laughs> but the church is positioned now in an amazing place spiritually. So God, you know, he, he, he walks his people through seasons where at times he's doing more to us than through us, more in us than he is out from us. So we not only go from strength to strength, faith to faith, brighter and brighter till the full day, glory to glory. We actually go from outpouring to outpouring. We go from revival to revival. We go from wave, not the little bitty ones where he's working in your life or congregation. I'm talking about earth now. I'm talking about the planet. I'm talking about the big picture. So we go from outpouring to outpouring. So in the charismatic movement, the last great worldwide revival was the charismatic movement in the 60s, 70s, early 80s. Jesus People Movement was a part of it. 50 million people at least saved and baptized the Holy Spirit in the charismatic movement. At least. And that's just, that's just, the, that's just the, the immediate outpouring. That doesn't, that doesn't count all the millions since then that have been brought into the kingdom because of the people that were brought into the kingdom. Because a lot of the leaders today were born again and moved into what they do now back then. But, you know, he started talking to people immediately about another one. Another great revival's coming. Some of us believe. Everybody I run with believes it. That this one's going to be the biggest ever. The, great, the greatest ever. I believe we're going to see more people saved in the next 20 years than we saw saved in the previous 2,000. I think entire nations that would not even be considered not just not a Christian nation, it's sort of pretty much not allowed. They are so steeped in other mindsets, ideologies, that there will be nations under that now. That will be on fire on in the fires of revival, and most of the people in that nation will be born again in 10, 20 years. Because the greatest season of multiplying the family is coming. So you, if you understand that in the waiting season. Why didn't you do it? I mean, the, the charismatic movement probably ended, Jesus' people, it probably ended in the early 80s. You know, you can't put a, a year on it, but one, two, three, four. I mean, by, basically by the middle of that decade, people that were historians, church historians, people that think along those lines realize the, that momentum, that revival is over. Doesn't mean God's not moving and doing things. It means that that outpouring, that movement, it doesn't even mean we're not going to keep on doing what was done in the movement. It means that that big tidal wave that just couldn't be stopped, the momentum. I mean, during the charismatic movement, you could preach heresy and people get saved. <laughs> I'm not, you know, I'm not defending it. I'm just saying. The, 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 the atmosphere was so thick with revelation, anointing, power. I did one guy, I, I went to speak for, I, I, was, I wasn't, I was there with a speaker. I didn't go to speak, I was there with the speaker. And I heard him talk about what God was doing in this movement. He said, it doesn't matter what we do, there are going to be 40, 50, 50 people get saved. He said, oh, I'm going to, he said, tonight I'm going to speak on tithing. But trust me, 40 or 50 people will get saved. <laughs> he spoke on tithing. 
gave an altar call. 40, 50 people pretty much ran. He didn't mix into it, you know, baiting them and trying. He just taught them tithing. He said, now some of you probably here, you don't know the Lord at all. And you, you know, you're not part of God's family. Blah, blah, blah. And we're going to invite you now. Here they came. And I just went, I can't even get him saved when I preach on the cross. He preaches on tithing. <laughs> kind of an anointing is this? Well, it was what God was doing. And God wasn't just doing it because I'm finally in the mood to do this. He had, he had worked in the atmosphere and the people in the spirit realm to where now things were ready and ripe and he could do it. This was what he was building toward. This is why you got to be able to discern the times. So what he's done in the, so, so a lot of people think, you know, why didn't this next one start in, in the 80s? Or not, why didn't you just start another one right away? Well, because God wanted to do some things in the church. Because he, if he didn't do what he's done in the church over the past 40 years, he could not do to the magnitude he wants to do what he's about to do. I know that's really a crazy sentence, but I think you got it. Because here comes a wave of worship. When, that, when we started at the end, by the end of the charismatic movement, I mean, worship was this is the day, this is the, I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my I'm not knocking it, I'm just saying it's where we were. And when I look back and say, what has he done over the last 30, 40 years? bringing his people into this place of understanding that what we're doing is literally communing with him. But this is, this is a communion. This is a, this is a, it's a love fest. It's God enjoying the family and vice versa. But he also, you know, he, he had to get the fivefold gifts of Jesus restored. Because that's what they are. Those aren't positions. Those are anointings of Christ. That's what the word Christ means, Christos, the anointed one. So Christ took of himself, broke his, himself into five gifts and gave them to the church so we could represent him fully. So we took gifts and made them positions. But they're not positions, and it's not a hierarchy. It's different giftings, anointings of Jesus that he's given to his body and to the ecclesia so we can fully reveal him in the earth. So by the time that movement ended, we had pastors, evangelists, teachers. We didn't have apostles and prophets, but he went to work in the 80s and 90s, restored prophetic understanding, anointing. Then he finished by uh, restoring apostolic understanding of what that means. And here we are. It's not there, everybody's walking in all that yet. I get that, but it's been restored. So those walking in that, and there will be millions more who do have the ability as his body to fully manifest who he is in the earth. Go back and read Ephesians 4, 11, 12, 13, 14. That's what it says. But he had, to under, he had to do more than that. He had to restore understanding that we're the ecclesia. That we're not the church just because we gather and sing some songs and we don't build buildings and call them churches that you are my governing legislative arm. You are my authority in the earth. And he had to restore that. So here we are. And the prayer movement had to, had to take place because we didn't know anything about prayer and the, uh, uh, hardly. I mean, it was just well, my, well, you know, until, the, until, the, until the early 80s. Yeah, I prayed over my food. And now I laid me down to sleep. And then I prayed on Wednesday night for two or three minutes in the service. And 
all of a sudden this thing called the prayer movement comes along. Ministry, entire ministries are being born just to pray. And books are being written. How many books do you write on? Ask me and I'll do it. It's like, <laughs> I wrote my first book, Intercessor Prayer, and I said, won't you write another one? I said, oh, what else, does, what else can I say? I don't know, 10 books later, I found some more things to say. <laughs> because he was restoring revelation of this is who you are and this is what you're going to do for me. And he has now brought us to the place where he has a people ready to manifest who he is on planet earth. I'm just going to say that again. He now has his people to a place, at least a remnant, and it's a growing remnant. And it's not just happening in America. And it's not just about America. But he has a people now that are understanding enough about who he is and who he's made them to be and what he wants them to do and what he's commissioned them to do, what he's authorized them to do and what he has empowered them to do and what he's put on the inside of them to do it for him. He has a people now that are beginning to understand this and the earth is about to shake and quake under the power of the Spirit of God. They were not going to minister religion to people and systems and join mine and don't leave that one be here. We're not trying to build our own ministries. We're not trying to build our own kingdoms. We're trying to reveal Jesus to the planet. So, this, now I'm not going to keep you here all night. I'm going to wrap this up in the next 20 minutes. But, <laughs> but let me just say this. That is probably the longest introduction I've ever done because, <laughs> because what I want to say in the next 10 or 15 minutes, really, is the... the end of what I've been talking about. So I get this, you know, dream. I have these dreams sent to me all the time now. God has taken this prophetic restoration to a place of incredible manifestation of his prophetic anointing. The dreams people are receiving now are just, and the pro prophecies and the, I mean, it's not just the prophets. I mean, you, don't, you don't even think anything about it anymore when you're in a circle of people and you're praying about something. Sometimes I just heard the Lord say, or I feel like we're supposed to do this. You don't go, whoa, they're prophetic. I wonder if God really told them that. <laughs> you just, you just under, we have come to a place where we understand his prophetic anointing is working in us. It's normal. But there are some called to be prophets. There are some that he matures the gift even more. And, and these, some of these, these, these dreams are just crazy. Even the prophets having them. So the ones that I know, and I'm, there are others that aren't in my circle, but they'll say things to me like, I, I, I don't know what to do with this. I wake up weeping. And I grab my recorder and I just try to talk it as quick as I can. And sometimes I just sit there for an hour and just weep over what I just dreamed. But a friend of mine recently, he's had a short dream about me. Much of the time when somebody has a dream about me, it's not about me. Oftentimes it's about the ecclesia. So he gives me messages and insights through that that are not just for me. It's, it's who I represent. It's us. I represent us. You do too. Yeah, I mean, we're a movement. 
We're not the movement. We're not the elite. I'm just saying, those that understand prayer, the prophetic, the apostolic, ecclesia, we have become a movement. We're not, a, we're not a, an isolated movement. We're not a exalted, we're the best. We're, we're not an egotistical movement. We're just, there's a group of people that God has, he's matured them in these areas. And it's time, you know, it's time now to implement. I, I, I don't need to make that disclaimer here, do I? I probably shouldn't even waste my time on that. I just don't want to sound elitist. That's not what I'm trying to say at all. There are others that don't understand what I know about Ecclesia. They can do some other things a whole lot better than I can. So it's not an elitist thing. But this dream, <clears throat> I know when some of these dreams come, this is not about me. It's about the company that I'm a part of. So in this dream, I, I was at a location undisclosed in the dream to conduct a meeting with some other friends of mine that I minister with, and Cece was with me. And one of them looked at me and said, and I don't know if I've done a post on this or not, but if you've already heard it, just act like you haven't. That's how you act like you have it. Whoa! <laughs> I heard that last week. But in the dream, one of them looked at me and said, it's time to feed the river. It's time for, for you. So I'm going to say, it's time for the ecclesia. It's time for the intercessors. to feed the river. So then Cece and I walked off and we just, there was a river there and we were just sat down on the edge of the river and just enjoying one another's company and they were off doing something and a few minutes later they came to me again and one of them said, it's time to feed the river. So they brought me some buckets. You know, from the very beginning of this dream, I had no idea what it meant. We, what does that mean, feed the river? Not get in the river, not drink from the river, not cross the river, not swim in the river. Feed the river. Then they brought me these buckets and said, it's time for you to feed the river. So I walked out into the water and I walk down river, and every so often I just drop another bucket. Never ran out of buckets. Finally got to the end of that section of river, knew it was finished. Looked at little villages I'd passed by, little communities on the river. Then one of them in the dream, as after, after I finished and I was leaving the water, one of them said, Thanks, Dutch! We're going to catch some big ones now. Oh, well, maybe it's about catching some fish. <laughs> so, end of dream. So I have to go on this quest. It's just the way that God does a lot of these with me. I have to start digging. What are you saying with that? What does that mean? I have to read the Bible <laughs> and pray. <laughs> and say, what are you trying to say to me? I have to go on the hunt, seeking his insight and his revelation. And the only thing I knew to do, knew to do was to Look at passages where somebody put something in the river. Salt. A, a, a stick. Even them going into it. 
crossing over or rolling it back or hitting it with a mantle, a, a garment. I, I, I'm, just, I'm just digging. So when I got to Second Kings 2, it came alive. And it's the story of Elisha, who has just received the mantle of Elijah. He's going to have a double portion. Elijah is going to picture John, the forerunner. Elisha is going to picture Jesus with the double portion. So Elisha shows up at a place. They had just gone off to look for Elijah and couldn't find him because of the, cause some of those guys in the school of the prophets thought, you know, we can't just assume he's dead out there someplace. We need to go look for him. So they went and looked for him. Elisha said, don't, don't bother with it. You're not going to find him. But they, they went, they couldn't find him because he went to heaven in a fiery chariot. So he walks into Jericho. Now, this is fascinating to me because they had three schools of the prophets. And one of them was here in Jericho. Why would you establish one of your schools of the prophets in a place that had been cursed And the curse was, whoever raises the city back up is going to pay for it with the life of their son. Because Joshua spoke a curse over Jericho. And it worked. It was working. And I don't know why, other than God led them to do it there. So they come to him and they basically, and we'll just read, read a couple of verses here. The men of the city said to Elisha, verse 19, but don't put it on the screen because I don't want people getting ahead of me. I know the way you work and think, and I don't like it when you do it either. You wait till I get there. That's fine. Just leave it just like that. Now, listen to what they say. They say, the situation here in this city, Elisha, is pleasant. It's, it's good. This is the same word in Genesis. The land is good. But they said, the water's poison. The water's poison. Ra, evil is another translation. This is the word in Genesis, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. This, I didn't realize it until he sent me there through this dream, that, that this is a passage that pictures us in our fallen condition and what Elisha, what Jesus came to do to heal the defiled water that had cursed the earth. So they said, this is pleasant, it's good, but, but it's become, something has happened now. There's evil here, and it causes, and I don't know what my translation says, but I'm going to give you the, the Hebrew word anyway. It says, the land is, the water's bad, raw, evil, and the land, because of that, is unfruitful. Well, that's a pretty weak word, because in Hebrew it means barren, or that which causes abortion. This place is pleasant. We got a nice school going on here, and we feel like we're supposed to be here, but this curse is still working, and the water is poison, and it's messing with the land, and everything is just barren, 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 barren. It's just what happened in Genesis 1 when the Holy Spirit came and hovered over the darkness there. That word is tohu, it means barren. It's barren, it's defiled. It's poison in the Elijah. And, and yeah, you know, I'm, 
If, are you like me? You're glad God doesn't do it the way you would do it. Because yeah. my response would probably been something like, well, what do you expect? Why in the heck? You thought I was going to say it, didn't you? <laughs> Why in the heck did you build your school here? Don't you remember what Joshua did? But that's not what God had in mind. Because he takes no pleasure in judgment. I want that to go deep into your spirit. He delights in mercy. Do you believe that? He takes no pleasure in the judgment the wicked does he judge wickedness he has to do it at times he has to do it but I don't care how wicked the city is even when the prophet says you better get your house in order because God's coming to wipe out this city and somehow somebody starts getting the message we better repent and repentance starts happening in Nineveh and God says wait a minute wait a minute stop the judgment stuff They're repenting. I want to send revival. I don't take any pleasure in the judgment of these wicked. I want to redeem them. I love people. He, I can't, you know, I just want to hear some of these religious people that God couldn't do this or that because they did this country, they did that, or America's too far gone. I'm thinking, he said it's not the healthy that need it, it's the sick, folks. If There wouldn't be any need for revival if we didn't need revival. That's profound, wasn't it? There's never been a revival in history that when it came, it, was, it looked dark. Sin was abounding and rebellion and devastation. And God's not sitting there and saying, I've just been waiting for you to get to this point so I can hurt you. He said, I love it when mercy triumphs over judgment. So he says, you know, <laughs> I'm going to heal Jericho. I know what Joshua said, but I'm going to heal it. I'm going to take the city that's under a curse because of their idolatry, Baal worship, and child sacrifice. I'm going to bring my life into that cursed city because that's really what I want. So Elisha says, get me a new jar. That's us. We are the earthen vessel now. That he used. And Jesus said, and Elijah said, put what in that new jar? What did Elisha say put in there? Salt. Who, what did Jesus say that was? You are the salt of the earth. You are the salt. You are the salt. And I'm going to pour that in there. It's going to heal. So what's God saying to us now? He's saying, I'm going to pour you into, into the cities and the cursed places of the earth. Because I put my river in you and I cleansed you and healed you. And healed waters heal water. So when I saw this, and then it says, he, he pours in and the water's cleansed, purified. It's the word Rapha. Jehovah Rapha, the Lord, our healer. This is the word. When I looked up the word, I know what Rapha is. I looked it up anyway. I just love to do this. Brown Driver Briggs, the, the most probably respected Hebrew source, 
tells me all the ways it's used in Scripture. It's not just the Lord our healer, but it's, it's a word used to describe the healing of this and the healing of that. It's not just people. And then he gets to this, and I'm just, I'm just wanting to tear pages out and throw them up in the air and <laughs> confetti, but I can't use that. Get me something. It's a word to describe the healing of nations. The healing of nation. This is a literal phrase. The healing of national hurts. The healing of national defects or hurts. Then I was praying over this dream. I said, Lord, you know, what are you, what are you trying to say to me? He said, I want you to tell my people to stop cursing their cities. Yeah. I want them to stop cursing neighborhoods, nations, groups of people. I want them to start believing that I can redeem and that I want, I'd rather redeem the judge. Yes, I hate sin. Yes, I want to clean it up, but I love those people. And I want you to start telling them that I want to pour them as a healing agent into their community, city, nation. How do you do that? That'd be, one of the main ways you can do it is right here. You're going to stop speaking curses over it. And you're going to, when you ride through that neighborhood or that city, when you Sarasota folks drive through Sarasota, you better roll your window down and start prophesying life to the city of Sarasota. Are you listening to me? Because God's going to send revival to your community. He wants to do this. We are not trying to convince him. He wants to do this. He wants to pour you your blessing, your river. And if you if you'll in, in, enlist, you'll do it more than just out the window of your car. He'll start bringing cursed people to you from your city and neighborhood and they'll say, I don't want to be this way. Can you help me? And you'll say, yes! Yes, I can help you! We used to sing, I've got a river of life flowing out of it. What have I done? Okay, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. Come on, somebody do it. I've got a river of life flowing out. Come on! Makes the lame to walk and the blind to see. Opens prison doors, sets the captives free. And I've got a river of life flowing out. Spring up! Spring up, oh well. Come on! Within my soul. Spring up, oh well, and make me whole. <laughs> Spring up, oh well, and give to me that life abundantly. Come on, I got a river. I got a river. Makes the lame to walk at. There it is. Opens prison doors, <laughs> set to cap. I've got a river of life flow. Spring up! Spring up, oh well. And make me whole. Spring up, oh well. And give to me thy life abundantly. Come on! See, I didn't do that myself because I didn't want to hurt you. I didn't want to <laughs> mess with the atmosphere of the room. You go, we're going to pray. Because 
and I'm not going to do this, okay? Even for the night owls, I'm not going to do this. But if I went for another 30 minutes to an hour, I'm not going to do it. I would go to Ezekiel 47, and I would talk about the river. Because everywhere it goes, everywhere it goes, that which is dead, cursed, plague, the fish, no fish, it all is Raphad healed. And I will tell you this much. The word river there is a different word than the typical word for a river. Nakal means literally a winter torrent. Not because it flows in the winter, but because it is created by winter. Because a nakal is a stream or river created by the melting snow and ice of the winter season. This is why in the vision, it starts as a trickle. And a little farther down the mountain, it's ankle deep and then knee deep and then waist deep. And if you've ever been to Colorado in the springtime or mountainous place, you've seen it. I've literally seen it. So this is what he's saying to me. Yeah, there's been a winter season. There's not been a lot of outward fruit, but I've been working in the church. And now it's time for the rising river of my spirit. And everywhere they go, everything is going to live wherever the river goes. Wherever you go. Please let that go into your heart. Wherever you go. Wherever you go. He wants the river in your womb to be released. To bring healing. To cursed people and places. Let's pray. Give me some music. We're going to pray for you. We're going to recommission you. I'm not your apostolic leader and I can't send you with that level of accountability, etc., but I can commission you as a general. And I'm going to commission you in this prayer. And then we're going to pray for this region and nation. We're going to pour the salt. We're going to put healed water into demonized cities and regions. We're going to feed the river. You can sit, you can stand, you can kneel, whatever you want to do. You don't have to receive this. But many of you will. Lord, I commission the ecclesia to step forward into a new era with the mantle of the Lord Jesus himself wrapped around them, with his very nature in them and his heart in them, his breath in them, his very breath, Holy Spirit inside of them, authorized by you to speak in your name.
I commission them to stand up in this hour and to accept their God-given blessing, responsibility, assignment. And to realize I'm a part of Dad's big family. I'm not, I'm not just a bystander. I'm, I'm the plan. I'm ready to take my place in this army, in this government, in this family. And I'm ready to go to a new level. And I'm asking you, Holy Spirit, for fresh revelation. I release over this place right now. And those watching, I release. Come on, engage your faith with me right now. The spirit of wisdom and revelation come to you. Go to a higher place of wisdom and revelation from this night forward. You will open your Bible and you will see things you've never seen before. You will dream the dreams of heaven. You will move in prophecy, words of knowledge, words of wisdom. You will hear more clearly than you've ever heard before. you will step forward and you will step forward with new confidence not because of who you are but because of the revelation of who is in you that they went forth preaching and working and praying for the sick Mark 16 and the Lord went with them confirming the word with signs following you're going to do that I commission you to heal the sick cast out demons raise the dead preach a powerful gospel of the kingdom that expects results pray in faith pour in the salt speak blessing over cursed cities neighborhoods people pour who you are into them bless them I commission you to be strong in the Lord, the power of his might. Be a good soldier, a faithful son, daughter. Love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. I commission you in the name of the Lord. To be a lover, a passionate lover of God. I, I say, Lord, as representatives of you, carriers of your river, your salt that preserves flavors. We commit to you that we will be more aware of what we say. When we see people addicted, broken, lost, rebellious, we will not curse them. release life over them. We will speak in ways that release your power, your sword to cut off of them. Because you are coming to heal the national wounds here and around the world. Your Rafa anointing heals nations, not just people, but nations, 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 nations. America shall be saved. America shall be saved. And I charge you to not think like a normal human being. 
You are not a normal human being. You are supernatural. You are filled with the Spirit of God. You are an ambassador of the King. You must think differently. I commission you, charge you, think differently. Think like a son and daughter of the Most High God. Think like His ambassador on the earth. Think, function, operate. Let Him transform your thinking. You are not weak. You are not helpless. You are not a victim. You are not stuck in the past. You are strong in the Lord. You are more than a conqueror. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. You are a warrior. You fear no evil. Now I'm just going to finish with this. I commission you, go do Mark 16. Preach the gospel of the kingdom. People are going to get saved, delivered, filled with the spirit. Demon, poison, serpents, not going to be able to hurt you. You're going to, you're going to be strong against all of that. And I commission you to do Matthew 28. You disciple them, entire regions, cities, communities, nations. You teach them the ways of God. Because there's coming a mantle and an anointing to do that. And there's coming a hunger when they, get, when they come to Jesus. They're going to want to know what he thinks. And I commission you to reconstitute communities into kingdom thinking. And break the stupid off of them. And I don't mean that in a mean spirit either. Don't just call them stupid. Break that stupidity off of them. I'm done. Feed the river.